Theresa May is meeting European Council President Donald Tusk today to give him a sneak peek of the themes in her big Brexit speech tomorrow. But hanging in the air will be the reaction on both sides of the channel to the EU's draft withdrawal agreement, published yesterday, which set out the Commission's view of the legal consequences of December's deal on the first phase of negotiations. Now, it's fair to say that here in the UK, it went down like a cup of cold sick, with lots of people and not just Eurosceptics of long standing. The hostile response centred around the EU's fallback option to keep the Irish border open in the event of no deal with the EU trying to put it in law that, if the talks collapse, Northern Ireland would remain bound to EU rules and regulations, even if Great Britain decided to go another way. Well, yesterday at PMQs, Theresa May kicked back hard, saying no British Prime Minister could ever agree to an effective border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And last night, David Davis was talking tough to his Tory colleagues, saying that there was no way the UK would be handing over billions of pounds in a divorce bill until everything was agreed to the UK's satisfaction. Former Prime Minister John Major was on hand dispensing his wisdom to the government. He said that by the time Brexit happened, the electorate would have changed. So Parliament had to have a decisive and free vote now. Nobody can truly know what the will of the people may then be. So let Parliament decide or put the issue back to the people. John Major there. And yesterday, the government also said, in an apparent U-turn, that EU citizens who come here during the transition will get indefinite leave to remain. But in a sticking point with the EU, the British government says British judges must have the final say over their rights and not the European Court of Justice. Well, to discuss all this, we're joined from Central Lobby by the Labour MP Pat McFadden, who is a supporter of the pro-European group Open Britain, and in the studio by the former Conservative leader Ian Duncan-Smith. Welcome to both of you. Pat McFadden, first of all, do you accept that there was no way the government could sign up to a deal that keeps Northern Ireland effectively in the EU? Has the EU pushed too hard? What the EU has <laughs> done here is thrown down a, a gauntlet in a way to the government and they've said there are three ways of meeting the commitments that you, the United Kingdom, <coughs> agreed to in December. Mm. Remember, this is based on an agreement made just a matter of weeks ago in December where the government agreed that there was a common body of EU law and policy that underpinned the Ireland economy between North and South and that they would try to maintain that either by agreement or by this backstop option. And what we can't have in this debate is the government having set out various red lines about leaving the customs union, leaving the single market, having no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, and also the UK as a whole, securing the exact same benefits, the exact same benefits that's the phrase David Davis used, that when those things become difficult, that we lash out and blame everybody else. So it's for the Prime Minister now, if she doesn't like the text published by the EU yesterday, to say how she is going to square those circles and meet those commitments. Right, Ian Duncan-Smith, what is the government getting so het up about? What are you and your colleagues getting so het up about? We expected this, didn't we? That was what was going to be written down in legal text on the basis of what was agreed in December. Well, let's get this out in context. This is the EU's pitch for what they believe will be the final outcome. This is one element of it, which is their view that there will be no deal, no arrangement, nothing at all. So the government's response is quite right. They've said, we don't agree with that, we don't agree that's how it'll look, and therefore we're rejecting that as a legal text <laughs> that has to be agreed but by the But hang on, sides. that's the fallback option. That, that's not all the options. But I mean, they're, what they're doing is they're setting out yeah. what was supposedly agreed in December. Isn't the real problem that actually it just wasn't nailed down, it was kicked into the long grass? No, I think the real problem here is that the EU has gone for an option which simply is absurd. And let me just complete this, OK? Because Right now, there is no need for that kind of border, that kind of problem, no matter what the arrangement is. And I'll give you three very good examples why. One, uh, they're unreported mostly by almost any channel that I'm aware of. The head of HMRC, the head of DEFRA, have both appeared in front of the DEXU committee and others, and they were asked, whatever the outcome, 
do you believe we will have to have a hard border with Czechs? And they have both said no. And the reason they've said that is because they believe their systems will allow them quite categorically not to do it. The second bit of that is that the, the, in the EU Parliament, they themselves have produced a report in which they said this is an opportunity for the EU to agree a form of frictionless border with the UK using the right technology that could be applied for the rest of the EU. And they've been somewhat critical of the Commission and its belief that there would have to be a hard border in Northern Ireland. Right now, we don't have one. We don't need one in the future. It's wholly feasible for us to do that. That would have been far better for them to have put forward as the final fallback option. Right. Pat McFadden, isn't Ian Duncan Smith right in this aspect that there is bad faith from the EU? It undermines the whole idea of the constitutional settlement of the United Kingdom, which they know the UK could never sign up to. Well, let me make two points. The first is mm. that we are in a unique situation historically here because this will be the first time ever that Northern Ireland will be outside the European Union but the Republic inside. Now in the past we had a situation where both places were outside the European Union before sure. we joined and for 40 odd years where they were both inside. So this is historically unique and it's not simple. And secondly, this is based upon things that we have agreed. So if we don't like the way that the European Union has worded it, then the challenge is for us to come up with something convincing that can be agreed ourselves. Right, but hasn't the government put forward the idea of technical solutions? You just heard Ian Duncan Smith citing the example of DEFRA representatives saying ways can be found, um, and HMRC, ways can be found, whether it is through pre-clearance or declaration before people reach that border, that you can keep it open and you can keep it frictionless. Isn't the EU using the political situation in Ireland and with the UK to beat the UK into agreeing to keep Northern Ireland at least in the customs union? No, there's, look, there's, uh, the thigh bone is connected to the knee bone here. Hmm. There is no need for a border down the Irish Sea because the Northern Ireland question here is actually a crystallisation of the question facing the whole of the UK, which is, and this is the essential choice before us, we can either have a system of high market access with minimal barriers and all the benefits that the government says it wants to have, and that will come with high obligations to have a common set of rules. Or we can do what I think most Brexiteers seem to want, which is to have uh, low obligations, but alongside that will come low level, a lower level of market access. What we can't have, what is an illusion which the government must stop peddling is to pretend that we can have exactly the same market access that we have now with a much lower set of obligations. Right. That's the reason agreement is not being reached and we've got to get off that illusion and make the fundamental choice right. that the country faces. Pat McFadden calls it an illusion. Others have called it magical thinking, fairy godmother. I mean, isn't it time to accept that this mythical image that you and your colleagues have of a solution that keeps all the benefits, keeps the frictionless trade, but means we don't have to sign up to any of the laws and rules and regulations, is just gone. Let's separate two elements from this, which is really important. The first is what happens at the border. Now, what happens at the border, there is no need for any of these physical checks, hang on, for delays. Whoa. And there's a reason for that. I've given you the examples of that. You, there are lots of other countries in the world that have trade arrangements that don't go through this process. Well, well but not even Norway so, has a border so, where there is yeah, some that's infrastructure. That's because the EU insisted that Norway had a border. If you talk to the Norwegians, they will tell well, you they don't believe they need a border. But let me just... Yeah, but hang on, before... Me, I will, I'll, I'll let, let you come on, continue, but first... I've just no, divided into on, this, on this thesis uh, of yours, um, you can't blame the EU because there is no trust, Ian Duncan Smith. And I put to you there's no trust because they have seen the likes of leaked letters and memos from the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, suggesting a hard border wouldn't be that bad. <laughs> and comparing that border, or having no border, to the di it being the same as two London boroughs and the divisions between them, that is why they don't trust you and you can't blame them. Ah, look, I don't think there's anything to do with trust, actually. This well, is to do with... Well, was it helpful of Boris Johnson to... Uh, to... Uh, Boris was trying to illustrate the fact that the technology exists for all sorts of items to be passed through from one location to another at different levels, but at the same time to have been registered. And, you know, all of this can be picked up quite happily. Now, the point I want to make about this, you asked me this question. Yes, go on. There are two elements. The border issue is being used by the EU and by Ireland to 
try and force us into position. Now, this is about negotiation, so it's not about trust. The other element that Pat was talking about just then is about market access. Look, we're leaving. And we won't have exactly the same kind of access in that one sense. But you do not know, and we do not know, and you're sitting here with somebody right now who actually is in the business of running a company and selling things, we don't know how business will react. My general view is business will continue to sell and to trade with the EU. Well, let's ask Our, him. our responsibility is to ensure that we have the least amount of friction in that, but the competition is up to British business, and I believe they'll meet that challenge without a single problem. Well, can you? Will you? Mm. Yes, we will. I mean, I think the, the, uh, the, the whole issue is mischaracterised. Just give one example, which is uh, we sell... Copperberg cider from Sweden and Weatherspoon, it's the number one cider in Sweden and we sell more or did at one stage than the whole of Sweden combined. Uh, it's from a small town in southern Sweden. If we, uh, if impediments are put in the way of trade by the EU for the sake of argument and we switch to the perfectly good cider suppliers in this country, who suffers? The answer is it's exactly. the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, citizens of the EU, but they're, they're, the people who represent them aren't elected. So unlike Ian or the Prime Minister or uh, the other politicians you've heard from, they aren't elected. That's the difficulty. But it's not a case of the UK, people like us, get lots of stuff from all around the world, are going to struggle. We can immediately eliminate the customs duties, invisible, but everyone in the UK pays for them. Right. What do you say to that, Pat McFadden? Well, you know, I'm on the uh, exit in the EU select committee that Ian Duncan Smith referred to, and we take evidence of this all the time. And what we've been told is there is nowhere in the world which pulls out of a customs union in a way that we're proposing to where that doesn't result in a border, including the border between Norway and Sweden, which is a high-tech border, but it's a border all the same, and there are checks all the same. We were even told by uh, someone from uh, Turkey recently that their trucks are held up for up to two days at the border. So I think there's a lot of people still need to be convinced that the government... This comes down to these incompatible red lines where they've said they want absolutely no border in Ireland but they also mm. want to pull out of the common system of rules and customs duties that has helped to facilitate that over the years. Right. The government has failed to square that circle. And let me just say something else. Faced with the incompatibility of those red lines, what you see from Boris Johnson and from others in <coughs> recent days is comments now saying a border won't be so bad or even worse, openly attacking the Good Friday Agreement. This is hugely irresponsible and is the result of the throwing out of these ideologically driven All red right. lines. Ian Duncan Smith, are you, as John Major, accused you and colleagues of boxing in the Prime Minister and making it impossible to square that circle to get a deal done? No, the Prime Minister has been very clear from day one on this when we left that she voted to remain but she recognises the vote to leave included leaving the customs union and the single market. And let me just take Pat to task about this. Of course there is a border. The question we're talking about is it is a border where you end up as this ridiculous scenario of queues of people <coughs> not being able to cross. Well you say it's ridiculous. Hang on, what evidence Turkey have you got that it would be ridiculous? Ago, Turkey has a customs arrangement right now. They mm. have a, a an entry to the customs union because they've chosen to to join it. Their recommendation, don't do a deal because these people don't stick by it. They have queues because the EU is imposing artificial uh, problems for them at the border. My point here is what we're looking for, and this is why this is a nonsense, the EU has chosen to discuss all of these bits and pieces before they discuss a trade arrangement. Yeah, but that everything, comes back to the issue of trust. They don't... Is, no, be, well, if David Davis, the it's Brexit Secretary, hang on, has said that he's going to withdraw uh, or renege on the commitment of paying uh, the divorce bill. Not reneging. Everything is agreed or nothing is agreed. Well, that's why they want it written down but in legal text. That's what the European Union, by the way, said. And so let me just point out to you... 
we are in the business of only agreeing the money with them if they are in the business of doing a reasonable deal. So my right. recommendation is they sit down and talk about trade. And as for Pat, and there's one last point on Pat and his party, this is a party that stood at the last election saying they were guaranteeing they were leaving the customs union. They have now reneged on, or as Frank Field said the other day, ratted on that. Yes. Those are the people right. that voted for Right, them. just so very briefly, Pat McFadden, trust. you were also are ratting, ratting on your own supporters, leave supporters. It is never ratting on Labour voters to put jobs and the economy first. We did not stand on a platform saying that we'd pull out of the customs union. We stood on a platform saying we would try to maintain the benefits of the customs union and the single market. And this week, we put jobs and people's standard of living first. Right. We're the Labour right. Party. That's what we're for. Pat McFadden, Ian Duncan-Smith, thank you.